It is now my pleasure to recognize the second panel of witnesses. Dr. Andrew Biggs is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute for Policy Research. Mr. Mark Mix is the president of the National Right to Work Committee. Dr. Robert Novi Marx is a professor of finance at the University of Rochester Simon Graduate School of Business. And let's see if I may get this right. Dr. Desmond Lachman, Lachman is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute for Pub Public Policy Research and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Pursuant to the House rules, all witnesses will be sworn in. Would you please rise to take the oath? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. We will suspend opening remarks. I simply want to thank you for your patience. I know that we had an audience that included your presence. And your testimony is every bit as important uh, because ultimately the facts will determine a great deal of what the committee does going forward. With that, Dr. Biggs. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, with that, Dr. Biggs. Thank you very much. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify with regard to the financial and budgetary challenges facing State governments. I will touch on three topics related to State government finances, public sector pensions, public employee compensation, and State investment practices. Financing for public employee pensions poses significant challenges, but as bad as the current pension funding situation may appear, the reality is likely far worse. The GAO reports that funding for public sector pensions currently equals around 12 percent of public sector wages. But these figures are based on a current accounting rules which allow plans to discount guaranteed benefit liabilities using the expected interest rate on a portfolio of risky assets. Economists are nearly unanimous in believing this approach to be both technically wrong, as it understates the true value of plan liabilities, and from a policy perspective dangerous, as it encourages State and local pensions to take excessive investment risk. If public sector pensions were required to use economically sound accounting rules, the cost of pension funding would rise from around 12 percent of employee wages to an astronomical 46 percent. This latter figure represents the true value of the pension benefits being promised and the true burden being placed on the public. The difference between the 12 percent and 46 percent figures represents the value of the risk that State pension funds are taking. States reduce the apparent pension cost burden by investing in risky assets, but this merely increases the contingent liabilities borne by taxpayers should investment returns falter. Whether States resolve risking rising employee health and pension costs by increased taxes or reduced benefits depends in part upon how they judge the overall compensation of public sector employees. A number of recent studies have concluded that public employees in Wisconsin and other States are significantly underpaid relative to what similar individuals would receive in the private sector. These studies have been cited in arguing against changes to public sector compensation. But existing analyses of State and local pay significantly undercount future pension benefits, omit entirely retiree health coverage, and ignore the value of higher public sector job security. Correcting for these errors generates very different conclusions. In certain large States, such as California, average public employee compensation is around 30 percent above what similar private sector workers would receive. In Wisconsin, we found a public sector pay premium of around 10 percent. While compensation varies from State to State, the broad view that State and local employees are significantly underpaid is almost certainly false. Finally, I wish to touch on the investment practices of State and local pensions. Public pension accounting literally says that a plan that takes more investment risk immediately becomes better funded, to the tune of tens or even hundreds of billions of dollars. For policymakers seeking to avoid difficult choices, riskier investment portfolios are an attractive alternative. Since the mid-1980s, the typical public sector pension portfolio has nearly doubled the share of equities that it holds. Today, the shift is towards so-called alternative investments, which include private equity, hedge funds, and the like. In forthcoming research, I calculate that public sector pensions have actually increased the risk of their target portfolio application, allocations since the financial crisis of 2007. 
There is the danger that rather than learning from experience, pensions will seek to double down in an effort to avoid the inevitable. A number of States have also issued billions of dollars of pension obligation bonds, meaning in effect that they are making risky investments with borrowed money. But increased risk in pension investments makes State and local finances as a whole more subject to the shifting winds of financial markets. Moreover, it is not clear that lawmakers fully understand the investments they are making. The solution to this problem is better pension accounting that removes the dangerous incentives towards ever-increasing levels of investment risk. Better information is the key to better policy. Lawmakers around the country can turn State and municipal finances around just as lawmakers here in Washington can turn around Federal finances. But time is a luxury that is growing short. While still mired in a recession, it is difficult to contemplate painful long-term reforms. But there is reason to believe that such reforms, if properly enacted, can generate new confidence among citizens, businesses, and financial markets that American government at all levels has the capacity to get on top of its budgetary problems. And during an economic slowdown, renewed confidence is essential to a recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Mix. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to participate. May we live in interesting times. That was an old, uh, allegedly an old Chinese blessing, and more accurately, a curse that seems to be a pronouncement appropriate for the topic of today's hearing. Clearly, there are tough choices ahead as States and municipalities deal with the clear and present danger of fiscal crisis. There is growing evidence that the fiscal house of many States and municipalities are in desperate states. Several questions arise as a takeoff point for this discussion, but an obvious one is what municipalities and States must do to fix it. But that question can't be answered until we understand the cause of the condition. This is where I will comment. I believe that the primary cause of the current condition is the inability to implement reform is a result of actions taken decades ago that empowered government union officials with privileges that are inappropriate for the functions of government. Specifically, I am talking about the granting private sector labor organizations the privilege of a monopoly bargaining over government workers. Let's be clear here. This does not mean that government workers don't have the right to join a union and they can't associate. It means about a recognition. That right shouldn't be taken away for the right to join and associate. But it does mean that the model that we ascribe to the private sector is completely inappropriate for government. And that is now becoming clear. And I am in good company with that premise. As we have heard already, the testimony of, uh, of members of Congress citing President Roosevelt's opposition to government bargaining. But he also agrees with George Meany, the new president of the AFL-CIO in 1955, who said it is impossible to, govern, to bargain collectively with the government. At the February 59 meeting of the AFL-CIO Executive Council, a statement prepared by representatives of the Government Employee Council was endorsed, which included the following. It said, in terms of accepted collective bargaining procedures, government workers have no right beyond the authority to petition Congress, a right available to every citizen. In New York State, the petri dish of government union power, excuse me, New York City, Democrat Mayor Robert Wagner was advised to break a campaign pledge made to government union officials because granting union monopoly bargaining would grant too much power to union officials and whet their appetites for even more. His advisors told him it would give unions too much sway over elected officials. And Wagner's advisors were right. After the New York City model had been in place for several years, former New York AFSCME Union President Victor Gottbaum boasted, we have the ability to elect our own boss. A New York State court spelled it out more precisely in the years earlier in a case called Railway Mail Associates v. Murphy, in which they opined to tolerate or recognize any combination of civil service employees of the government as a labor organization or union is not only incompatible with the spirit of democracy, but inconsistent with every principle upon which our government is founded. To admit is true that government employees have the power to halt the functions of government unless their demands are satisfied is to transfer to them all legislative, executive, and judicial power. Nothing could be more ridiculous. Fast forward to today, we see dramatic impact of the process which is inconsistent with every principle upon which our government is founded. In the May 2010 Business Insider website published a list of the nine States most likely to default. The news and analysis oriented site ranked heavily unionized California, Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, and Wisconsin as the worst default risks. An average of 61 percent of public sector employees in that nine States with the worst default risk are under union monopoly bargaining power in 2009. That is overall public unionization of 20 percent higher than the typical State. In the nine States with the worst default risk from 1999 to 2009, aggregate private sector jobs fell 4.2 percent, but State and local government jobs increased by 9 percent. Not one of the 22 States with the 2009 public sector unionization rate of under 30 percent was found to be on the Business Insider's most likely to default list. 
Further, Washington Examiner editor Dave Fredoso recently analyzed the relationship between public sector unionization and State per capita debt. Fredoso found that among the States with fewer than 40 percent of State and local government workers are unionized, the median per capita State debt in 2007 was $2,238. Among the States between 40 and 60, the median debt was $3,609. But among the States with more than 60 percent of the State and local government workers unionized with monopoly bargaining laws, the median per capita debt was $6,380. And these are, 19, or these are 2007 numbers before we even got to the economic crisis. Excessive spending, taxation and debt are endemic to governments everywhere. But there are large measurable differences between the States that have handed monopoly privileges to public sector union officials and States that have resisted the pressure. In any discussion of State and municipal debt and the tough choices ahead, they must include the issues of growing government union monopoly power and the impact on the States, municipalities and, most important, taxpayers. Thank you. Professor Novi Marks. Contrary to several of the statements made here this morning, uh, State and local pension systems are significantly underfunded. The shortfalls faced by these systems represent massive debts that public employees and retirees expect State and local taxpayers to repay. The amounts that are owed are large enough to threaten the continuing viability of many State and local government systems and pose considerable risk for Federal taxpayers. The exact magnitude of the problem has been con concealed by the flawed accounting methodology prescribed by the Government Accounting Standards Board, or GASB. I can illustrate these flaws with a simple example. If I take a dollar out of my right pocket and put it into my left pocket, I presume that you will all agree that doing so has made me neither richer nor poorer. Um, the idea that moving money from one pocket to another could somehow make you richer insults common sense. Yet this is the idea um, upon which the State's current claims that pension funds are only a trillion dollars underfunded is based. Under GASB rules, a plan's reported financial status improves when it takes on more investment risk. When a plan moves a dollar from its right pocket bonds into its left pocket stocks, it magically gets richer, less underfunded. This logic is clearly flawed. A dollar of stocks is not worth more than a dollar of bonds. When you as an individual move money from your money market fund into a stock, the stock market, you are not suddenly richer. You do not get to pretend that you owe less on your home mortgage. The payments that you are obligated to make on your house are completely unchanged. How you invest your assets has no impact on the current value of your liabilities. This is just as true for the States as it is for individuals, despite Gasby's claims to the contrary. Properly accounted for, the unfunded portion of pension promises already made to State and local workers is roughly $3 trillion, or three times as large as that recognized under GASB. This exceeds all recognized State and local debt combined and represents a debt owed to State and local government workers of roughly $25,000 for each U.S. household. These large, large unfunded liabilities are a serious concern, but perhaps even more troubling is how the current methodology accounts for new benefit accruals, that is, how governments value the retirement benefits as a part of workers' total annual compensation. Under current accounting, the annual recognized cost of newly earned pension benefits averages roughly 12 to 15 percent of total wages, with plan members contributing on average slightly less than half that amount. The true cost of new service accruals is roughly twice as large, 25 to 30 percent of total wages meaning that each year most State and local workers earn employer finance pension benefits worth more than 20 percent of their salaries. This is not to say that public employees are overcompensated. I personally value the services provided by government workers and am certain that many public sector workers are underpaid. This does not, however, provide an excuse for misvaluing the benefits they receive. Undervaluing the deferred compensation these pension benefits represent has serious negative consequences for the way governments operate it. It encourages excessive growth in the public sector. It also encourages States to finance current operations with off-balance sheet debt, leaving even larger bills for future taxpayers. In negotiations between States and their workers, undervalued retirement benefits give both sides at the bargaining table incentives to trade current wages for future pension benefits. Workers will happily give up a dollar today for two dollars worth of benefits that the government accounting methodology values at less than a dollar. Current administrations may happily agree to this arrangement if it frees up money in current budgets. As a result, State, City and County pension plans have become a pervasive tool for circumventing balanced budget requirements. Because the current contributions fall short of the cost of new benefit accruals, the State and local pension problem is getting worse, not better, and this represents a concern for the Federal Government. If the Federal Government cannot credibly commit to allowing States to fail, then the States have little incentive to fix their problems. In the event of a Federal bailout, taxpayers in fiscally more responsible States 
will subsidize those in more profligate states. So any state that undertakes the unpalatable combination of tax increases and service cuts required, ser service cuts required to address its pension problems now risks losing its share of any Federal funds used in the future to rescue the system. The Federal Government consequently has an urgent need to establish incentives for states to deal with their pension problems. The Public Employee Pension Transparency Act, H.R. 567, is a useful first step. Congress should consider even stronger measures, however, to ensure that Federal taxpayers are not the ultimate underwriter of State debts. These should include incentives for States to close current plans to new workers and to instead enroll new hires in transparent, defined contribution plans and Social Security. They should also encourage States to fully recognize the true magnitude of their legacy pension liabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lachman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for inviting me to testify before this committee. The European sovereign debt crisis offers a cautionary tale to the United States about the very high costs that could be associated with continuous delays in fashioning a credible medium-term plan to address its budget problems. In 1999, when the euro was first launched, the European Stability and Growth Pact required that member countries contain their budget deficits to no more than 3 percent of GDP and that they maintain their public debt levels at below 60 percent of GDP. Despite those strictures, by 2009, Greece and Ireland registered budget deficits around 15 percent of GDP, while Portugal and Spain registered budget deficits in the region of 10 percent of GDP. It is now expected that Greece and Ireland's public debt to GDP will reach over 160 per cent and 120 per cent, respectively, by 2012, even under optimistic assumptions. A notable feature of the European debt crisis is that until very recently, markets failed to discipline profligate governments in the European periphery and those governments were able to borrow at interest rates only marginally higher than those required of the German government. Markets also provided the financing that made possible massive housing market bubbles in Ireland and Spain, and they failed to exercise their de desired disciplinary function in the mistaken belief that this time was different and that Eurozone membership would automatically make countries in the European periphery converge to the strong economic performance of the German economy. The important lesson for the United States is that when markets did finally turn on the European periphery, they did so in an abrupt and dramatic fashion. Greek and Irish governments were effectively shut out of the capital markets. They were forced to seek bailout packages from the IMF and the EU. And more recently, last week, the caretaker Portuguese government was also forced to seek an EU bailout. As external funding for the Portuguese government totally dried up. Despite these massive bailout packages, markets are still demanding very high interest rates now of these countries. And these high interest rates imply that the market is attaching a very high probability to the likelihood that these countries will actually default on their sovereign debt within the next three to five years. As a condition for their bailout lending, the IMF and EU are requiring of Greece and Ireland massive budget adjustment of the order of 10 percent of GDP over the next three years. Countries in the European periphery are now finding that attempting to dramatically tighten their budgets without being in the position to weaken their currencies to boost export growth is a recipe for steep economic recession in these countries. Sadly, Greece and Ireland are already finding this out. Over the past two years, GDP has declined in Greece and Ireland by 8 and 12 percent, respectively, and the unemployment rates have both, cl both climbed beyond 14 percent. To sum up, Europe's recent difficult experiences with its public finances would seem to offer the United States the following four cautionary lessons. First, U.S. policymakers should not take comfort from the fact that despite its very poor public finances, the U.S. government can still finance itself at very low interest rates. Up till early 2010, the Greek, Irish, Portuguese governments all were able to fund themselves at relatively low interest rates, only to find themselves subsequently virtually shut out of the capital market. The second point is that when markets finally do lose confidence in the sustainability of a government's public finances, they tend to do so in an abrupt 
and disruptive manner. This tends to be highly disruptive to financial markets and it tends to be associated with prolonged and deep economic recessions. One also finds that once a government loses the market's confidence, it proves difficult to regain the market's trust. Thirdly, dependence on foreign sources of financing exposes a government to the vicissitudes of foreign credit markets. It also places a government in a position where foreigners can dictate the terms of future lending can, that can be harmful to a country's economic prospects. Finally, disruption in a government's bond market can have an import, important implications for the financial system, which tends to be a primary holder of government bonds. Experience shows that a weakened financial system is generally associated with lower long-term growth. Thank you. Thank you. I will yield myself five minutes at this time. Professor Novi Marks, uh, in some of your published studies, you seem to take issue with Vermont's governor's theory that he's first fully funded and then adequately funded. Uh, if we make reasonable assumptions that today, for some reason, they chose to go to a defined contribution, how much underfunding would there be in the legacy of Vermont's uh, system? Um, so I, I don't know if you're talking about a soft freeze or a hard freeze. Are we talking about moving well, if, all if you, workers if, onto DC plans or just new hires? Well, if you assume that it's all workers, that um, they whatever they've accrued they keep, and obviously there's some middle ground of those who are three or four or five years. But if assuming you phased it out very quickly, it would improve the position of their their financial it, status of their pension plans. It also. would improve that. But what would be the shortfall in their pension? In other words, if they achieve the 8.5 percent starting the day that you shut it off, they would be able to make all of their payments forever. Is that correct? Um, they would have a small shortfall, but not a huge shortfall, if they made 8 percent on their assets. Yeah. What is the reasonable belief that 8.5 percent can be made, particularly considering that they have credit it, it default less, swaps? It is, it is less than 50 percent that they would make that, that sort of return. Um, Essentially, they have borrowed a lot of money to speculate in the stock market. And if the stock market does better than the, the cost of their borrowing, they will be in a better position. Uh, if it does worse, they will be in a much worse position. But I view this idea that you can achieve 8.5 percent by investing in the stock market as essentially borrowing public money to, in, to speculate in the stock market. So. And if we assume for a moment that there is some discount for inflation in the 8.5 percent, let's call it 2.5 percent, they are really saying they want to they want to earn 6 percent over inflation. Would that be correct, um, roughly? So, uh, so they are looking at in, making in 6 In terms of their own plans, they assume inflation rates that are higher than the market or consensus estimates. If we were to use a baseline, and this may delve into others, we would use a baseline, let's say, of from any given time till 1980, in other words, not the last 30 years, is there any ability to achieve broadly 6 percent over inflation in America's 20th century. Is there any 20-year period in which you can earn that kind of money? Um, the, the two decades after World War II, the, the U.S. stock market did very well, and your returns would have exceeded that. Are there any 20 years in which you can't? There certainly are, yes. So what we are really doing is we are saying we think we are going to make it, but if we don't, and I just want to get to the next point, if we don't make it, then what happens? And let me just, and I am a Californian, so I'm, I live this every day. During good times, good economic times, times in which the market is performing and so is America, the need for the social safety network generally goes down. So the government spending, State government spending, Medicaid and so on, typically goes down. If that is the case, then when you have lower spending, you have higher earnings within those 10 or 20 years. Turn it around. When the market goes to heck in a handbasket, typically you have people laid off in greater public need. Is that sort of universally agreed to by all the panel? So no matter what we are dealing with, we are assuming that the present system is one in which you must pay in more over a three-, five-year period. All of these plans have a certain waiting period. Typically they are trailing three years or something. Some of them go five. But in any really long, bad time of 10 years, for example, you are going to have to pay in more at a time in which you are paying out more. Is that generally true? That is true. So for any of you on the panel, 
even forgetting about ideological reasons that we may want to choose other systems. The Governor of Vermont said this was more efficient. Let's assume efficiency is as he defines. Is it better for the reliability to the taxpayer, the people who will count on services in bad times and who, in fact, don't want to be misled in good times? Is there any basis to say that that system of needing more money paid into pensions at a time when there is less to pay and more needed, and then needing less so you look good exactly at a time when it is only because people need less from the government? I, th I think you have put your finger on, on, the, on the, the fundamental sort of error in, in, in the Governor's reasoning. The, the bad times for the pension, the bad rates of return on its investments will correlate with bad times in the rest of the economy, which means more people out of work, lower tax revenues, higher expenditures for unemployment benefits, things like that. So you are asking taxpayers or contributors to the plan to pay extra into the plan to make up for losses at exactly the time they are least able to do that. Um, so that is that's the problem. And when you get this correlation between the poor market outcomes and poor outcomes in, in, in other parts of the economy, it makes it more painful to do those things. A market valuation approach to looking at pension financing implicitly takes that into account, whereas the current uh, GASB rules ignore that fact. Anyone else have a brief? Yes, Ms. Doctor. I just add to the point that you are making that we don't live in ordinary times, that we are living in a period where we have had an asset price bust, where we have had real strains in the banking system. There is plenty of economic research that shows that those periods are followed by unusually low growth, where you would expect to get very poor returns on equities. All you have got to do is look at the Japanese experience right now. Lost 1989, decade. well, 1989, the Nikkei was at 39,000. Today, at 20 years later, it is at 10,000. So we are living in a different time to expect to get an 8 percent return uh, after an economic crisis like this would seem to me to be heroic. Thank you. The gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, you all heard the testimony of the two governors, did you not? And you heard uh, Governor Walker uh, numerous times uh, saying that he liked what uh, Mitch Daniels did in Indiana. Did you all hear that? And it um, sounds like he may be his mentor. But let me ask about the legislation recently introduced in Indiana. This legislation would make it a misdemeanor for an employer to require an individual to become or remain a member of a labor organization, pay dues, fees, or other charges to a labor organization, or pay charity to another third party that represents dues, fees, or other charges required of members of a labor organization. Governor Mitch Daniels originally favored this legislation and prior bills that opposed unions. In 2005, he signed an executive order limiting collective bargaining for State workers. As a result, according to an April 13 National Review article, the number of State union workers shrunk from over 16,000 in 2005 to now nearly 1,500. Mr. Mix, your organization support Indiana's legislation, is that right? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, we oppose the, uh, the the statutory in imposing of bargaining rights in Indiana going back to in the middle 1990s. Uh, it was imposed by executive order by Governor Evan Bayh, uh, and then there was an executive order signed by Governor Frank O'Bannon to force Indiana employees to pay dues or fees to the union to keep their job. What Governor Daniels did was simply repeal that executive order that authorized bargaining in the state. So there was never a statute there. So you, so you we support what Governor Daniels did. Yes. You, you support what he did, and despite your organization's support, Governor Daniels has now withdrawn support from this legislation. Have you heard that? He is. He is. He has indicated that he opposes consideration of a right to work bill, which was the reason that 39 Democrats left the state for 33 days uh, and shut down the Indiana legislature. He opposes that right to work bill that's pending in the Indiana House right and now. And a February February 22nd article featured in Politico indicated that Governor thought there was a better time and place to have the debate. Is that right? I think that's right. That's accurate. He also stated that even the smallest minority has every right, and I'm quoting him, by the way. Yes, sir every right to express the strength of its views and 
and I salute those who did, end of quote. Do you agree with that? Well, if Governor Daniels is talking about the fact that 39 Democrats left the State to stop this legislation, I disagree with him. All right. On ex I only have a limited amount of time. I've got, I heard you. You disagree with him, okay? I disagree with him praising 39 members leaving their jobs to stop the bill. Yes. You disagree with him? Yes, sir. Your organization does not just support the concept of this uh, legislation. You have financially pushed it, have you not? Your organization? Uh, what legislation are you talking about? I am talking about the subject matter that we are talking about right now. That is? The right to work bill is different than what Governor Daniels did. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been involved in Indiana in a while, for a while now. Yeah. And, and so you put some money uh, in this. And according to an article on March 23rd in the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette, your organization began a, and I quote, $100,000 statewide media campaign to try to get the issue back on the table. Does it sound accurate? Absolutely. And one newspaper ad uh, tries to shame Daniels uh, and Bosma for bending to the unions, and that is the uh, end of quote. Mr. Bosma is a Republican Speaker of the Indiana House, is that right? Yes, sir. And Mr. Mix, did your organization place those advertisements? We did. And staff have identified at least 10 Republican governors, including Governor Daniels, who have distanced themselves from Governor Walker and, in particular, his assault on collective bargaining rights for workers. But your organization continues to agree with the Governor Walker's actions. Is that correct? Yes. I think this hearing has demonstrated that Governor Walker wildly overreached by insisting on stripping the rights of American workers, even when such measures would have, uh, have absolutely no impact on the State budget. And, Mr. Biggs, I wanted to follow up on a point that I think is extremely important. As Governor Shublin uh, sh uh, made very clear in his testimony earlier, the budget shortfalls that are affecting States today were not caused by middle class American workers. They were not caused by these teachers and nurses, policemen, farm fighters. Uh, Shublin testified that, and, and, and this is his quote, I would like to start by directly addressing the question of what is causing the current fiscal crisis that most of our States are experiencing. Put simply, these crises are the result of the greatest economic recession since the Depression, the Great Depression. Dr. Biggs, do you agree with that? I think that is generally correct, yeah. And, Dr. Biggs, on March 15, 2011, you testified before this committee, and you seemed to agree with Governor Schumann's point. In your testimony, you said this. He said the fiscal crisis at the State and local level has many causes. The proximate cause is the significant economic recession from which the United States economy still struggles to recover. Did you say that? That is correct. And in your testimony today, Mr. Biggs, you explained that the different States, that different States may have different challenges based on how the economic crisis affected them. You stated that when looking at the financial challenges faced by States, the differences arise from how how hard the states were hit by the recession. Is that right? That is also correct, yes. And so, uh, you, you, so you are you are not alone, and as I close, in your views uh, that these budget shortfalls are a result of recession. And let me read Ezra Klein uh, what he wrote in the Washington Post. He says, quote, there was no sharp rise in collective bargaining in 2006 and 2007, no major reforms of the country's labor laws, no dramatic change in how unions organize, and yet State budgets collapse. So I say this all to, our, to all of you witnesses. If you want to talk about balancing the State budget, then let us talk about the budget, let us talk about the real reasons for shortfall, and let us talk about the real solutions. I see my time has expired. Thank you. I thank the Ranking Member. Ms. Burkle is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panelists for being here today and for uh, answering our questions. My uh, first question, and this is sort of a, a follow-up to my colleague Mr. Cummings' question. Mr. Mix, in your written remarks, you, uh, you note that there is a cor close correlation between high State debt and the existence of public sector monopoly bargaining. Can you explain that for me and, and just expound on that a little bit? Yes, ma'am. I, I think the correlation between the cost of government and the, the proposition, the union density is something that is becoming clear. And if you look at the numbers that I cited from uh, the study regarding per capita median state debt per person, I, I think you see that coming clearly. 
I, I think it is important also to understand that you know, the idea of bargaining and the, the ability for a private third party to in, engage themselves in the relationships between taxpayers and their elected officials is something we need to address. And I think if you look at the states, the, the nine states that are running the risk of default, all those states had a union density over 60 percent in the government sector. I represent uh, an area of New York State, and actually, Professor Novi Marx, it is close to uh, Rochester. So we are one of those 44 states that was, they were spoken of this morning that we teeter on this, uh, this delicate balance here. And um, so I would like to just follow up again with my uh, colleagues, uh, Mr. Cummings' comment. With regards to Governor Walker, do you feel that he overreached, Mr. Mix? I don't. I think the idea that allowing workers the choice to join or financially support a labor union is a basic right. Uh, the legislation that the part of the legislation that Governor Walker talked about and was in, in question here today was a provision granting Wisconsin public employees the right to work free of union compulsion. Any member that believes the union, the union represents them well and wants them to speak for them can voluntarily join that organization and have their voices heard, just like any other citizen can. But we should not presume that, there are work, that every worker out there supports what organized labor is doing for them and that there is a benefit conferred on those people. What we ought to do is give them the choice. And what union officials ought to do is represent only those workers that want their representation, because we know that any organization that is brought together through voluntary means is inherently stronger than any organization that is compelled, uh, is, is, is cobbled together by compulsion. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Lachman. Um, you note in your written remarks that the United States budget deficit has swollen, uh, as we know, to close to $1.5 trillion, about 10 percent of the GDP. Um, it is on a path to reach within a year or two um, the, the levels of funding crisis that we have seen in other countries. What common sense, practical steps can we take as a nation to just avoid what we have seen uh, from some of our countries? Well, you are absolutely right that the United States is on a path that is clearly unsustainable and that will lead to a debt crisis going down the road. The sensible thing for the United States to do would be to have a medium-term budget program that seriously and credibly addressed those problems that brought down the deficit progressively over time. You are seeing that, for instance, in the United Kingdom right now, where they have got a medium-term budget plan that is going to be reducing the budget deficit by something like 1.8 percentage points of GDP a year, bringing it down from something like 10 to 3 within a, a period of time. But they are doing it in a credible way with actual measures passed through their parliament. It would seem that that is what is needed you know, if you are going to be assuring markets that you are seriously dealing with the problem rather than just running up huge deficits and then have the markets fear that the Federal Reserve is going to monetize it and we are going to be off to the races on inflation. And just in the uh, few seconds that I have left, can you just define or expand uh, on that credible way that you are you're talking about? Well, I think that it is imp important to do things in a variety of ways is that to backload a fiscal plan isn't really credible. There are a lot of changes that might occur down the road that what one's wanting is one's wanting upfront concrete measures in where there's a clear congressional commitment that measures are going to be actually implemented. You know, it's no good just talking about we intend to do things that you've got to back it up by action that markets are going to believe that you are actually going to be delivering. You know, and that having benchmarks, having a path on which you are going, having concrete measures that you are going to be taking, actually passing those measures, you know, would give the markets a lot more confidence right now. And I think that the only point that I was really trying to get across is not to be fooled by the fact that the United States government with its huge deficit is able to borrow in the Treasury market at, say, 3 percent on 10-year bonds, that can move in a heartbeat. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our panelists. I yield back. I, I thank my colleague. Um, uh, Dr. Biggs, I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Dr. Biggs, um, 
We have, we have I had this discussion before in a series of hearings we have had um, uh, about the State and municipal debt crisis, that there is a choice government has to make with the revenues it gets from its people. So, you know, when we have pension funds, a discussion about pension funds, if it is a private sector pension fund, if it is underfunded, those that should receive the pension are the ones that are getting harmed. If it is underfunded in the private sector, there is another group, sort of the forgotten man, if you will, um, that are the taxpayers um, that are either going to pay higher taxes because these, these pensions were underfunded, whether it is through union contracts or what it, whatever it may be. Then you have not only taxpayers, but those people that desire a benefit out of their government. For, for instance, you live in a city and they lay off half the fire department or some of the police, or they don't have frequent uh, uh, trash service. I mean, th there are services you would diminish in order to meet certain demands. Can you talk about this in terms of what, what that actually means, those choices? Well, I think this plays very well into the, the issue of how we measure the, uh, the pension liabilities. The, the, one of the arguments for the way current accounting rules for pensions is, you know, government is different than the private sector. Government is infinitely lived. It is very big. It will go on forever. So we can ignore this risk. But when you look at how the risk is actually allocated, government is a pass-through entity. It doesn't bear the risk. It distributes it to different stakeholders. So when we look around the country today, we see uh, individuals who are having to pay higher taxes to support pensions. We see layoffs in, in government workforces. We see cuts in other programs so they can make room for their pension contributions. So it is not the government that is bearing the risk of those market uh, downturns. It is effectively individuals who are bearing it. And so that is why we should value uh, these pension liabilities the way that individuals do it. Um, I think the one, one sort of troubling aspect of the way uh, defined benefit pensions the public sector have, have worked in practice is often the market risk is one-sided. In very good economic times, part of the money goes to help fund the pension, but there is also the temptation to raise benefits. We saw this in California. We have seen it in New Jersey. We have seen it in Washington State. But in the down times, it is the taxpayer who, who, who takes that risk. So anytime you have one-sided bets, you are you're, you're setting yourself up for some problems. But the key issue is, is really it is not government that is bearing the risk. It is people all in all aspects of our lives. And so we want to catch that, that issue there in terms of how we value these liabilities. Can you also discuss in terms of asset sales, whether at the State or, or at municipal level, um, that you have an asset that, that, that local governments have sold in order to meet uh, immediate expenses, as, a, as these asset sales as a form of indirect bankruptcy, if you will? In, in a sense, I guess selling off an asset is like borrowing because the asset, in theory, would give you value down the road. But if you are if you're selling it off, you are saying we are going to get some cash today, but we are giving up all that stream of payments that we otherwise could have had it. But I think in, the, the point you make is correct. If you are if having to sell off assets that you would otherwise want to keep in order to make payments, it's, uh, it, it is a, a form of partial bankruptcy. It is a, it, it's in effect eating your seed corn, because those are assets you are going to need down the road. Okay. Can you, you, talked, you mentioned uh, that, um, the importance of getting the accounting right. And uh, Dr. Nova Marks, you, you did as, as well, and you are more specific. But Dr. Biggs, can you talk about this in terms of, of accounting? Mm -hmm. And, well, my, uh, yeah. The funny thing is my, my father was a certified public accountant, and I remember growing up thinking, oh, these accounting things are so boring, and you know, why would you want to do that? What I have discovered working in, in public policy is what you do about a problem really depends on how you measure the problem. Uh, the way we currently uh, measure public uh, pension financing, we learn two things from that. The, the current measures tell us the problem is small and can be solved by taking more investment risk. Using proper accounting measures, we realize the opposite. The problem is large, and taking more investment risk isn't going to solve it. Right. So, so talking about accounting sounds boring, but I think if you really measure things correctly, you get an idea of how big your problem is and what will and what won't fix it. Dr. Navarro. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not an expert on unions and don't have a lot to say about them per se, no, but I think there is a real danger in bargaining over things which are improperly valued. So I think that the, the valuation of the pension liabilities very much interacts with the bargaining, because if we way undervalue these benefits, it makes it extremely hard for 
uh, the government side to argue, to, to bargain from a fair position. Excellent. So, um, uh, Dr. Biggs, in, in terms of this, there is uh, the GASB versus FASB. You have got the government uh, accounting, and, and to you, Dr. Nevermarks, um, because I think you both can answer, have some shed, you can shed some light on this. Um, there are different accounting standards for the uh, public sector as opposed to the private sector. Um, I'm interested in this, uh, this difference, and I also have a very specific question. So if you will answer the specific question and get to the larger point, because uh, I, I, um, my time is running short. But um, I, actually, I'm over time, but with a, the graciousness of, of my colleagues. Um, the SEC has designated uh, FASB as, as the, the accounting uh, for publicly held companies. What about designating GASB as, as, in terms of being able to capture? Um, the SEC basically captures uh, stale data at the broker-dealer level. What about capturing that, that, that data um, more upstream from the issuer? It, it, would that be better? Um, would that give more transparency and more disclosure? Uh, and can you touch on that? Well, pension, so if you will answer that, then get to the larger point, I would appreciate it. Your pension disclosure in the, private, or in, the, in the public sector, I think, is not as strong as it is in the private sector, where often in the public sector the actuarial reports come out you know, a year or more um, after the, the events that they are trying to date. In general, I mean, I have written about a private sector pension accounting, and I have been critical of it in, in, in ways, but it much more closely approximates how you should measure, measure the liabilities. A, a a public or a private sector pension benefit is very secure, but it is not guaranteed. If, if the sponsor uh, goes bankrupt, the, the retirees can lose some of their benefits. So the, those liabilities are, are discounted at a rate of return derived from corporate bonds. It means it is very safe, but it is not totally safe. With, uh, with um, public sector pensions, the, the benefits are effectively guaranteed, often by State constitutions. That means they should be discounted at a lower interest rate. Instead, they are discounted at a higher discount rate. The GASB rules have things just precisely, precisely opposite of the way they should be. Dr. Novomarks? I have nothing to add. I agree with him completely. Okay. Um, finally, and then we will go to my colleague, Ms. Maloney. Um, Devin Nunes has introduced a piece of legislation in terms of uh, uh, transparency. Um, it, it perhaps strikes at the heart of, of making sure you have accurate disclosures for public sector pensions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Biggs, what, can you touch on that? Do you, do you, are you mm -hmm. favorable to this perspective? What are your thoughts on it? I think uh, the, the disclosure bill sponsored by Congressman Nunes would be very helpful, and it would require every uh, State to disclose uh, the market value of their pension liabilities, which means, A, you would get the numbers uh, that would be much more accurate, but, B, they would also be uniform between States. I testified several weeks ago alongside um, several individuals from the ratings agencies, and I, I got the impression they simply took the data from the, from the public sector pensions as they published it. But I think it is important if you have a, a better measure of the liabilities and also a measure that is truly apples and ap to apples from State to State. So I, I think that would be a very, very helpful step. Anyone have anything to add there? Um, I think it would be a very helpful step as well. I think that there is actually a lot more information they could disclose. They actually forecast current uh, expected cash flows every year into the future in calculating the liability, and there is no reason that they don't disclose that. It, it should be public information. They are public entities. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. Thank you, and I thank all of you for your testimony. I regret I had a conflict uh, with another meeting, but I did uh, um, read uh, your testimony. And uh, it, is, it, it contributes to the debate. So thank you. I, I'd like to begin with uh, Dr. Biggs, um, and uh, it really uh, I'm going back to a lot of the debate that we had in the panel before you. Um, uh, many people blame the the for poor financial um, condition of states on public pension systems, as if pension underfunding is the primary cause of a state's financial problems. And in, in fact. Uh, the Republican staff on this committee issued two briefing memos that made this exact argument, if I could quote, the largest threat to State and municipal fiscal security is the government-sponsored pension plans. Yet in the prior panel, 
Uh, there were a series of editorials uh, that I put together for this hearing from a clear across the country, and they were saying that, that, they were, that it wasn't a financial problem in, 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 uh, in those particular editorials. So uh, my question, Dr. Biggs, is given, given what we heard from the governors and from the uh, editorial boards, uh, do you agree with this assertion that the largest threat to State municipal fiscal uh, financial security is government-sponsored pension plans? Well, as I uh, stated in my testimony, the, the, the drivers and the cause of the deficits that uh, State and local governments are, are suffering from now were distinct from public pension plans, were distinct from public employee compensation. The, the question you are asking, though, is slightly different. Say, what is the largest threat? to uh, State and local finances. And that, that raises some different questions, because the, the pensions have shifted so heavily towards risky investments that even a small change in the rate of return they would receive would have significant impact on, on planned financing and on State budgets. For example, recently in California, the, the, the board of CalPERS, the, the public plan there, rejected their actuaries um, recommendation they shift from an assumed rate of return of 7 and 3 quarters percent down to 7 and a half percent. And the argument that the people made was we can't afford the extra payments that we required by assuming a reduction of one quarter percentage point in our assumed rate of return. The problem is if you are investing in the sorts of assets they are, which are heavy on equities, foreign investments, hedge funds, if you can't mm -hmm. afford yeah. to lose 25 basis points in your rate of return, yeah. you are in very big trouble. Well, actually, there is another hearing going on in financial services I need to get to. And we, in the regulatory reform bill, uh, we tried to really bring some controls and safety uh, to some of these investments. But I would like to ask about an analysis uh, by the National Association of State Retirement Administrators. And according to this analysis, less than 3 percent of all State and local government spending was used uh, to fund public pen pension benefits. Uh, do, you ag do you agree with this, or do you dispute this data? Oh, no, I, I agree that that agree? figure is correct. The problem is, first, that a lot of states are not meeting, with, their th with the amount they are paying today, are not meeting the obligations they are supposed to pay under the more lax accounting rules from, from GASB, and, B, if they use more honest accounting, they would have to pay significantly more than that. One example I looked at was Illinois, which was not even meeting its, its sort of actuarially required payments. If they had to pay the market value of their payments, it would be something like 14 percent of their State budget. That gets very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to um, cite another study uh, from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And according to this study, the primary cause of pension shortfalls in our country was the economic collapse that we suffered in 2008, rather than inadequate contributions to government retirement programs. Well, I think the argument made in that paper was that the, the shortfalls they are looking at now were a result of the downturn in the assets that they held. One reason they were holding so much risky assets was because it allows them to discount their liabilities at a high interest rate. So in effect, the, the poor state of funding we are seeing now is a, is a function of the investment choices they made, and those investment choices they made were driven by the accounting. We are trying to bring more accountability in those investment choices, but I would like to ask Dr. Big. Biggs, isn't it true that while pension plan underfunding is a problem for some States, uh, there are more than a dozen States rated by the Pew Center as solid performers? Let me put it to you this way. Um, the Department of Labor has standards for the health of private sector pension plans. I believe a private sector pension plan that is under 80 percent funded is considered endangered, and a plan that is under 60 percent funded is considered critical. If public sector plans were required to use private sector accounting methods, I don't believe there would be a public sector plan in the country that would be more than 60 percent funded. They would all be considered critical. The accounting is very, very important here. Well, I, I, to put it in, um, and I agree, you need accurate and uniform accounting uh, systems. Um, we just came out of a, a national recession, and um, it, it was certainly the greatest recession in, in my lifetime and probably yours. And uh, to me, it seems inaccurate and, and very unfair 
to tie the current uh, financial problems that some States face with public retirement systems underfunding to a long-term uh, pension crisis. Um, uh, most economists, uh, even uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, Mr. Hall, Dr. Hall, um, who, uh, states that uh, this was the first recession that was caused by the financial markets. It, was this, it caused this uh, deep uh, pain in this recession. And to say that, that, uh, that because some States have some problems, that, that, that this is the cause of the problem. So, I, don't, I don't believe mm -hmm. I have said mm -hmm. that public pensions are the cause of the problems. I am not really aware of anybody else who has said that. What I would say is that the, the public pensions, because they are investing so aggressively, are particularly vulnerable to the financial downturn that we had. And the second, that even if the recession was caused by other factors, you know, we can't go back to Wall Street or we can't go back to the, the housing market and say fix our problems. We have the problems that we have and we have to make some decisions on, on, on how to fix our budgets going forward mm -hmm. and how to fix these programs so that they are more robust in, in future years. If I am hearing you correctly, you said many of the problems came from investing so aggressively. So if the managers of the pension funds are the ones that are putting them in jeopardy, uh, maybe we need stricter uh, standards there and capital requirements and so forth. And it, it is not the managers. What happens in most States is the legislature will set the discount rate that they want to use for the pension. They will say, we want to use an 8 percent discount rate. And they tend to choose a high discount rate because that makes the liabilities look small, that makes the annual payments small. Then the fund itself has to go out and say, well, how are we going to get 8 percent? You can't get 8 percent without taking a lot of risk. So now they are shifting more and more into alternative investments. An example I had from uh, you know, Wisconsin school districts were uh, investing their pension funds in you know, synthetic collateralized debt obligations. It is this chasing returns that is driven by the fact that a high return is imposed on them by legislatures who want to minimize the payments they want to make today. Well, thank you. And uh, if you have any final no, 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 thank you very much. Really, thank you very much. Thank you. And I appreciate the general lady's uh, comments and questions. And I appreciate the panel's uh, uh, testimony here today. This is uh, certainly a critical issue, as we have heard from the, the governors and as we have heard from previous hearings on the municipal and state uh, debt crisis that they are facing, budget crisis. Uh, Dr. Lachman, I have heard your, uh, you speak before. I wanted to ask a final question, if I might. Does the euro survive? Uh, it depends what you mean by that. Uh, that <laughs> if you mean are countries going to leave the euro, uh, my strong conviction is they certainly are going to leave the euro. That if we look where the euro is going to be in five years' time, I'd be highly surprised if Ireland, Greece, Portugal, Spain, maybe Italy, whether they are part of the euro. But that doesn't mean that the euro disappears as a currency that what you could get is you could get the euro, which is going to have uh, as its members you know, the original strong countries of the North, the Germanys, the Frances, the Finlands, the Belgians, and so on. Thank you, Dr. Lachman. I appreciate you indulging me on that, that question. I do appreciate your, your testimony. And uh, if you have further things for the record, we would certainly welcome that. And I know members will have seven legislative days to, to uh, submit questions or comments for the record. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your hard work. Thank you.